Hello and welcome to another virtual author event, the Poison Pen Bookstore. Our special guest today is Jane M. Krantz, under her alter ego, Jane Castle, who's going to talk to us about her new book. But before we start, I do want to mention that we have copies of Jane's new book, Guild Boss, available at the Poison Pen, but they are going fast. So if you're interested in the signed copy, we're down to our last dozen. So call or go online. We'd be happy to put a copy in the mail or hold one at the bookstore for you. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jane Ann Krentz. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. We're always lucky and love to have you here at the Poison Pen. Why don't we start first by having you tell us a little bit about yourself before you became a New York Times bestselling author. Now, from what I remember, you were a reader early on. I, th I think the book that changed my life was probably, uh, came into my life when I was 19 years old. So that's about when I found it. And it was uh, Anne McCaffrey's Restoree, oh. which was the first, and at the time, the only uh, version of what we would call futuristic romantic suspense. Hmm. And I don't think it did her career any good because there were no more. She moved on to dragons and Pern and a whole other world. Uh, but it changed my life. <laughs> and I spent the next few years looking for something like it. And eventually I stumbled into what we now call the romance genre and became an avid reader. And then there comes a point, I think, for a lot of writers where they just, they want to tell the story their way. It's not that they think they can do it. Certainly in my case, I didn't think I could do it better than anyone else. I had a lot to learn for crying out loud, but I just felt the urge to tell the story my way. I needed my voice, my ending, my characters, and there was no other way to do it except try to get it down on paper. So it started out as kind of an experimental hobby and grew into a passion. Because now if I go away from writing too long, I get twitchy. <laughs> it's an addiction. Well, I think your um, career as a writer kind of is ser can serve as inspiration for other aspiring writers out there because you were not an overnight sensation. It took you six years or something to get published. Six years, yeah. Hmm. The difference now, of course, is there are options in terms of independent publishing, but um, but in I think most writers want the want the validation of being published in paper and in and that and being in a bookstore, that in the library, those things mean a lot. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your new Jane Castle book, Guild Boss? <laughs> Guild Boss. Okay, well, I should, this is one of those, either you know the dark side of this book or you don't know the dark side <laughs> of the series. For those, for those who don't know the, the dark side, it involves dust bunnies, which are little psychic creatures who, started out in the series as just little add-on characters. They were little, like a little cat or something or a little dog in the background, but they were psychic and they saw what was happening and they realized they wanted a bigger piece of the action. And so by the time the second book came out and the third book came out, <laughs> I was starting to, to hear from readers at signings and in the email, which is, Basically, we want more dust bunnies. <laughs> and, and nobody seemed to care about my clever plots or my, my insightful characters, my, my layered world building, all that good stuff. It was just, give us more dust bunnies. Mm -hmm. So they kind of took over the world. It, it, they did take over the world. Um, <laughs> and all I can say is that it wasn't the plan back at the start. <laughs> So um, if, if you like the animal thing, um, this is your series. <laughs> You'll have to put up with the futuristic settings and the, the world building and all that stuff, but there will be dust bunnies. Now, in, this, in the case of Guild Boss, it starts off with one of your protagonists being kidnapped, essentially, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, she's, uh, she went to a wedding party, a wedding reception, and the after party turned bad, and she got kidnapped. And she spent, she spent three days down in the underworld, which is oh, the ruins of an ancient civilization under the surface at, on this planet. And she spent three days down there surviving on raw determination and cold pizza. <laughs> and the cold pizza is being supplied by the dust bunny, mm -hmm. whose name is Otis, by the way. Well, that's and important. Then, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> his name comes before the heroes. <laughs> the, um, he, the hero, however, is, 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 is pretty cool. I like the money, right? Um, and his name is Gabriel Jones. Uh, fans of yours will kind of note the reference to that. Um, I loved the book. What I loved, um, one of the things I loved about it was the heroine is rescued by the guild boss, uh, soon to be guild boss. So she should be grateful, but at the same time, he kind of destroys her reputation. So it's kind of a love-hate relationship with them. Yes, he, he performs this valiant rescue and then leaves town. <laughs> <laughs> and she winds up in a um, secret psychiatric hospital, which is trying to drug her into for nefarious reasons, obviously. And uh, this time she has to rescue herself, but luckily, and so, the, her reputation is ruined. She now has a job driving a uh, tourist truck through a, uh, a tourist zone in the in the area, and um, and then the, the new guild boss returns to town and has the nerve to think they should just take up where they left off. <laughs> and so. from that point, things uh, rapidly evolve, as they say in the business. Um, you currently write under three different names, Jane Ann Krenz for your contemporary romantic suspense, Amanda Quick for your historical romantic suspense, and Jane Castle, like today, for your futuristic romantic suspense. Was this really a clever plan on your part when you were starting out as an author? Oh, it's kind of like the Dust Buddies. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, and if there are any aspiring writers out there, I do not recommend using multiple names. Pick one and stick with it. Um, and the real issue is promotion. Mm. You cannot make the world aware of three different names anymore. It's it's just a nightmare to try to do it. Uh, the social media gets confusing. Um, people, writers get confused. Writers, the writer gets confused. So do the readers. And I think above, I think the original idea, which in hindsight wasn't a bad idea, still holds true in that if you pick up a book written under one of my names, you're gonna have a sense of what fictional world you're walking into. So if you pick up an Amanda Quick, you know you're getting a historical setting. If you pick up a Jane Ann Krenz, you'll get a contemporary setting. And if you pick up Jane Castle, you're going to get a futuristic setting. That's, that's the upside of the multiple names. The downside, like I said, is letting people know about them. But in, in a funny kind of way, it may not be as important as I thought it was because it turns out readers, and you know this, John, readers, no matter what kind of genre they read, they often want a certain fictional landscape. Not every mystery reader is going to read modern noir or serial killers. A lot of mystery readers want a 19th century gaslight setting, mm -hmm. um, or they want early 20th century. Um, it's just... The fictional landscape is really important, and, and I'm as guilty of it as, any, as anybody. Uh, one of my favorite authors for years was Robert B. Parker, mystery writer, and his he had a series going on under the word under the name Appaloosa, the Appaloosa series, which was essentially essentially a western, a classic western. And, and I remember being in my editor's office one afternoon and looking for a, a book to read on the plane back home. And she said, oh, I know you love Robert Parker. I've got his latest. And I said, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> and she hands me Appaloosa. And I said, or the latest in the Appaloosa series. And I said, oh, I don't read those. <laughs> just, just, just like all the people have looked at me over the years and said, oh, I don't read the historicals. Um, and she said, Jane, it's just Spencer on a horse. <laughs> and I said, Spencer doesn't belong on a horse. <laughs> so I totally get the importance of the fictional landscapes. And now I've got three of them. Well, I think you kind of call them worlds. But what I think is uh, brilliant on your part or your publisher's part or your, your uh, marketing person's part is to kind of pr promote this idea of a Jane verse. There may be different worlds, but they're all under this kind of overarching. Um, it was my editor who pointed that out to me. I had been doing it unconsciously. And she said, it's essentially what every author does is build their old 
their own fictional universe and they spend their careers exploring it. And the exploration can take them into the future or the past or some experimental stuff. Um, but at the heart of it is your voice and your kind of storytelling. And that isn't gonna change very much from one section of the universe to the other. Um, and so I've taken it to the next step where I've tried running plot lines from the historical Amanda Quick books through the contemporary Jane Ann Crins books and then having a conclusion in the future. I have had long running families like the Joneses who went through all three worlds and are now in the future. And they have their history from the past. Um, it's been kind of fun to actually, once she made me aware of what I was doing, I ran with it because it was kind of fun <laughs> to set up this, this evolving universe. I think what you said is important. Your voice is the same. It doesn't matter what, whether you're writing as Amanda Quick or Jane Castle. That's consistent. And that's what many readers love about you. I also, um, and I can say this, if you're not familiar with Jane's books, if this is the first time you're reading them, you can still read them and enjoy them. But if you're a longtime fan, watching how you weave those little details from previous books into your current book, it's just a really like an added layer of enjoyment because... Um, uh, oh, now I'm getting mixed up because I'm thinking of the book that's coming in January, so I can't say anything about that. But um, you reference things that make you go back and look at um, your earlier Amanda Quick titles or your earlier Jane and Chris, just to see what's happened with these tiny little characters. How much planning does that take or does it just spontaneously happen? It just happens. Um, <laughs> I'm not much of a planner. <laughs> it's like everything... I'm not much of a plotter. I just keep working at it. And, and I, okay, here's what I think happens is that I start asking questions and I start asking in the case of a plot and say the case of the characters in the case of the landscape. It, I start, I just go down the what if thing and they say, well, how did they get there? Like when I open the, the opening of the book for Gilboss, I knew she was trapped down in the tunnels and that she was eating cold pizza thanks to the, the butt dust bunny but I hadn't yet decided how she got there, <laughs> which, and that, and then, so the next, quite, once I started that first sentence, I knew I had to come up with an explanation. When, when your brain kicks into that mode, you, you start looking at the book differently. You start looking at the writing differently. And, and that's the fun, and that's the joy and the stress of writing because you don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers when I sit down to write. I think some authors do. They know exactly where they're going. And I really envy that. They can plot out an entire book and then sit down and write it. I just can't do that. So, or if I did it, I could do it, but then I'd be bored with it because I would have told the story. So I'm kind of stuck with this winging it. Thing. <laughs> and then at the end, you look back and say, well, why didn't I see it all? There's, it's always, all, <laughs> it's like every single time it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> that works. <laughs> Well, I guess you have to go with if it ain't broke, um, don't fix it for you as a writer. But I know that at one point you said that when you, someone else was um, talking to you about your writing process, you said it doesn't matter if you create a detailed outline, you're going to toss it aside about three chapters in because you just have to write that way. Yeah, yeah, it's, you're kind of stuck with it, I think. Um, and if you are the type that needs the detailed outline first, that's, you're going to go that route. One way or another, it, everybody has a process and no two authors do it the same way. I, you know, off, when, I, when I do events like um, this, or, uh, there's always questions about the process. But I always have questions when I talk to my other writer friends. I'm always interested in their process because it is always different. It isn't quite the same. Um, it's, it's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> And the books get written. Um, now let's talk a little bit on a broader scale about popular fiction. Um, I know that you're not only an author, but you've also written about the romance genre. You were an early um, groundbreaker in terms of your uh, book, Dangerous Men and Adventurous Women, Romance Writers on the Appeal of Romance. That was back in the 90s. You were trying to get people to take the genre seriously. Um, I think you've said that the mistake most literary critics make when they 
is when they try to use literary fiction as the standard for popular fiction. The popular fiction descends from a different kind of storytelling tradition. Can you talk a little bit about that? I am absolutely convinced of that. I think literary fiction and popular fiction, and by that I mean all the genres, mystery, suspense, science fiction, glitz, glamour, um, romance, they have a different job. They are tasked, whether we realize it or not, consciously or not, those stories are tasked with the job of affirming our culture's core values and our culture's um, sense of what we're all about, what, what, the, what we're supposed to be doing here. <laughs> and, and, and I can, the, the simplest way to see that is because no matter what you view in terms of popular fiction, go to a movie or open a book, when the hero appears, no matter how flawed he is, no matter how suffering, you know, how much he's screwed up his life or anything else, we always know that in the end, the hero and the heroine have to do the right thing. They have to live by their values and their, or die by them, you know, depending on the storyline, but ultimately they have to be honorable. Even though they don't start out that way, they have to do the right thing. We all know how a hero or a heroine is supposed to react. And we get that from popular fiction, not particularly from literary fiction. We get it from popular fiction. And that's why these stories are so freaking important. Um, segue a little bit. When you're writing your books, do you always have to refer back? You've written a number of books that are trilogies or connected or have characters that move between worlds. How do you keep it all straight? Do you have like a Bible? Do you I wish. Back and forth? <laughs> Another thing at the start of my career, I should have had the foresight to do is start keeping track of all the characters. Somewhere along the line, it just became obvious that I had messed up by, by not, not doing that. I kind of go by the, if, if, if I can remember an incident or a character, um, it goes into, and, and it works into the story. Sometimes writing the new story brings back a memory of, of a character or an incident or, or a plot point. And that's how I use it. I don't really just, I don't have a Bible. I don't have a, I wish. I, I should have made a list of names because then I've lost track of how many times I've missed, you know, reused the name because I forgot I used it 10 years ago. And readers will, will contact me and say, well, is he related to the character and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I like, no, I don't think so, but I can't remember. So the, in terms of character names, the smartest thing I ever did was pick a long line family named Jones. <laughs> Easy to remember. You could, I could have unlimited Joneses in the, from now until the end of my career. So that was one of my smarter moves. First names are actually the hardest part for me because first names really, really have to fit the character in a way you can't explain. They just, they have to work. And, and there's a lot of bad names out there yeah. or a lot of names that don't fit my kind of characters. That would be a fair way to say it. And names are such an interesting thing. There's a, a at a certain point in your life, a name sounds like your grandparents. 50 years later, that name will sound fresh and original again. Yeah. So they go through cycles and certain names will sound so contemporary, you don't want to use them because remember the year there were a lot of Katie's out there. Um, and they're great. It's a great name, but it's, it's, it got used so often that it's, you want something more unique for a character in a book, more memorable. So names are, names are just an interesting subject in and of themselves. And every author will tell you they're very, they have little rules, unwritten rules. I never use the name of my, one of my family members. Yeah. I wouldn't put a member of my, even just using the name, I wouldn't put that into the book. And I don't even know why. I can't even tell you why. If I remember somebody I didn't like with that name, I probably won't use it either. I think what happens with the familiar names like that is that you wouldn't be able to unassociate them from the person behind it and you don't want that person's story in your book particularly that's not what you're writing so names are hard people i'm telling you <laughs> um, 
do you use like a baby names book or how do you come up with i've got a dozen of them yeah. yeah that's actually kind of an interesting subject in and of itself because the people who write baby names books are always trying to give you the latest and most current list of fashionable names and they really vary over the years it's yeah if you're a tip of the day for those who are writing and are looking for a good name one of the most useful sources i've ever found is the um Social social security list of oh. names. It is sorted by the decade, and it goes all the way back into the late, early nineteen hundreds. Very, it, it's just useful for stimulating the idea of a good name. Now, you might not have used um, any of your family or friends' names um, in your books, but have you ever based a character on people in real life? No, no. My characters are fundamentally archetypes. Okay. And I build, I build character around that archetype. Um, so, so when I start, when I when I get interested in the character, I'm not thinking about real psychological issues yet, you know, or anything like that, or or real personality types. I'm I'm starting with an archetype, and it the the character will develop over the course of the story. And I usually don't know everything about my characters until I actually get to the end. And then I'll know what they need to be real people for me. And I'll go back to the beginning and infuse that into the character throughout the book so that they hold together at the end, so, so to speak. But in the beginning, they're kind of stick figures, kind of moving, going through the actions until I figure out who they really are. I can see where you would say that. I think um, I might be wrong, but I think you do have some fun with your secondary characters, though. Those are a little bit more quirky and... Yeah, I'm thinking of like the um, killer you uh, created several years ago, who was like an opera singer and who kind of <laughs> yeah. sang people to death, essentially, and things like that. So, do you that's, have that, that's actually kind of I love that story because music. We all know music has power, mm -hmm. emotional power. It can make you cry. It can make you feel patriotic. It can make you feel adventurous. You know, it's just that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting power. And it comes with no words or no acting. It's strictly music. And almost everybody I know responds to music. So then I, that made me say, well, you could kill with it too. If you want. <laughs> Why not? And who, who better to do that than an opera singer? Mm -hmm. And then you have your, in your quick series, I probably don't get it right, but she's the woman who makes the auto Ottoman Ottomans the mechanical dolls oh yeah yeah the clockwork toys yes mm -hmm. uh -huh. um yeah and they actually show up in um they don't die those little clockwork toys they keep going from one generation to the yes. next because it's they're paranormal and it's really hard to get rid of them mm -hmm. um and they they show up in um in guild bus again mm -hmm. so yeah mrs bridewell's clockwork curiosities awesome. i think yeah. that's cool. yeah Mm -hmm. So they started, so that's an example of carrying something through my three names because they actually started out in my 19th century settings, the late Victorian settings. And clockwork toys were really a thing, um, curiosities, really elaborate and very cleverly made. And, um, and these just happen to have a paranormal element to them that have come down through all three names. <laughs> Never throw away a good idea. <laughs> Um, there's been a lot of talk uh, over the last couple of years by publishers, people in the publishing world, authors about brand. How would you describe your literary brand to someone that hasn't read your books? I think it's just, an, it's a, just a word that's been invented to describe what was always true, which is when it comes to authors, you generally often read by author. <laughs> you, you liked that author the last time, you go back to that author again and again. And that's what we now call branding. And, and the actual branding per se is just really creating a presence on social media. But the, but the basic, the core brand is actually the, the voice. Mm -hmm. And that's, what you, that's all you have to sell. That's all and everything. And without it, you won't have a brand, you won't have an identity but it's voice that makes, makes readers go back to an author again and again. And no two authors have the same voice. Mm -hmm. We both know you can give the same standard 
late Victorian mystery plot to 10 different mystery writers, you're going to get 10 different stories. And in essence, 10 different versions of that gaslight world. It, it just won't be the same from book to book. Um, so I think, I think branding is part of the part of the process. It happens on its own to a certain extent, but then you, in today's world, you have to figure out how to get the word out there, how to, how to promote it. In the old days, it was probably, you got the brand mostly from the New York Times monthly list of best-selling books mm -hmm. and everybody else didn't, <laughs> had a hard time getting any, any kind of uh, face time really on the, in the bookstores, but, but nowadays it's, it's much different. So when you're marketing, when you're marketing a new author in, in the poison pen and you want people to pay attention to it, how do you present it? What, how, how do you it can get into their heads? Dairy. Sometimes you try to signal to the reader that they're, they're like, not exactly like, but they have the spirit of another author. Like you might say, if you loved Sandra Brown, you'll love Jane Ann Krentz, or if you love Nora Roberts, Linda Howard might be a good choice. Or if you like Robert B. Parker, Sue Grafton's mysteries might work for you. So that sometimes will help a reader link the two. Um, sometimes an author has a unique backstory and that kind of is the marketing tool. I mean, one example I can think of recently was this summer, a book called Falling by Newman is the author's last name. And essentially it's about, it's a thriller set on um, a commercial airline. The stewardess, I believe, is the heroine protagonist. And someone has um, essentially said that if they don't bring the plane down, they're going to kill the crew members' families or something like that. But the interesting thing about marketing the book was the author herself had worked in the airline business as a stewardess. So she had all this kind of insider background knowledge to sell the books. So sometimes yeah. that's a way to um, like, like Clive Cussler brought all his knowledge of diving. Yes. And mm -hmm. yeah. And, and that was, and that to this day is really valued by those readers. The readers, if you read Clive Cussler, you read it because you trust him to, or whoever's writing with him now to do that, to carry forward that, that sense of real. This yeah. Is real. Yeah. yeah. You have to get those details right or readers will not forgive you. Uh, I mean, it's like, when you're looking for someone with an expertise in sports romances, it's Susan Elizabeth Phillips is the author that you go to for things like that. So, one of, one of the joys of uh, of world building in my futuristic world is I get to make all the rules and the details. <laughs> <laughs> and the only thing you have to remember when you start building a world without any rules that start when you're creating your own is that you will be creating your own rules. And once you've locked them in place, you do need to be consistent. That's yeah. what makes it feel real, is the con stick, sticking to the rules you make. And then that becomes a problem at some point because you've written yourself into a corner. And, uh, and now you're looking for a way to expand that world. I, I think could, I was going to say, I could really see a market for like a guide to the Jane verse. Somebody should be like collecting all this information, the characters, the different plot points. Um, and then compiling it in a book and then those new to your world or perhaps you when you're not remembering something could consult so berkeley if you're out there this is another marketing opportunity a guide to the jane verse well it's for sure if it happens it'll be somebody else who doesn't it's not going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and part of that is because i never go back and reread my own books you know once i've told a story i it's in the rearview mirror i just all i can think about is the next story once it's complete, it's a done deal, and I'm I'm on to the next book. So, have you ever had to go back and like look at really old titles and revise them for publication? No, I if if I felt that strongly that a book shouldn't be out there, I just wouldn't re republish it. Um, I I have no patience to go back and revise a book. It it's I, I'm too focused on the front, the mm -hmm. book I'm writing now, and I I just wouldn't have the patience for it. So. And they stand, you know, the book is of its time and there's yeah. no point trying to make it fit into today's rules and sensibilities and stuff. It just, it, it, it never was written with that intent. And it's, I don't think it meshes well. 
to try and force a, an older story and update it. I think yeah. it should be read as what it is. Well, I mean, you wrote for Harlequin for a number of years. And if you look back at all the authors that wrote, like in the 80s and the 90s, at that point, they were doing groundbreaking things like creating heroines who were in the workplace. And But if you're looking at through 21st century eyes, you also look back and see things that, well, that's not the way we do it now necessarily yeah. but that's that's the time period so you have to look at it mm -hmm. in that perspective yeah they were they were definitely in the forefront of women's fiction at the time but the time moves fast <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and fiction fiction is moving fast too we look at all the new books that come in to the poison pen on any given tuesday mm -hmm. when that's for those of you out there in the audience that's kind of the standard what they call lay down day is when the books are go on sale and it's almost what every Tuesday pretty yeah. pretty regularly and the bookstores get boxes coming through the, <laughs> coming through the loading dock and so with the supply chain thing going on sometimes it's more or less boxes depending on the day yeah um, how is it doing how is the supply chain thing working are you still getting the books you've ordered in on I, to the, for the most part, but there are exceptions. And I think most readers understand. It's like when you go to the grocery store and your favorite brand of jam isn't there. It's like, well, you know, it's sitting on the dock in Los Angeles or something waiting for a truck. You just have to be a little bit patient. But yeah. for the most part, I think um, most books are coming through. There's the odd title that might um, miss a shipment or things like that. But the good thing about books is they don't have an expiration date. They're good whenever you want to read them. That's right. Good point. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad to hear that, though. That's good. Maybe things are loosening up a bit. Starting. Yeah, we can hope. Well, though, I this is the part where I have to put on my bookseller chapeau and say, if you're thinking about Christmas gifts, do not delay. Order now. Doesn't matter whether it's from the Poison Pan or whatever bookstore. Don't wait until like two weeks or even a week before Christmas and expect things to get shipped or delivered or on time. Early is always better. Yeah, this this year that's a good rule. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Well, it looks like you've got a number of fans out there with some questions. So why don't we go ahead and take a few of those? Um, the first question is: Have you ever been approached by a company? I'm guessing to create a toy version of dust bunnies? And if so, why not? <laughs> uh, yeah, you see, that's what I mean. First question, let's talk about the dust bunnies. <laughs> no, the short answer is no, nobody's ever approached me about it. So, and I'm not gonna do it, so. <laughs> Would it be something that could be manufactured easily? Or I mean, I'm well, trying to think to, of you. We have to come up with a real design for it because yeah. in my mind, it's just kind of a big, ball of fluff most of the yeah. time with a couple little ears and six paws and and then it's like any animal it can go into a, a defense or attack mode and when it does that you, you see a lot of teeth and, and another set of eyes so I don't know I'm sure some clever toy designer could come up with a, a dust bunny but good luck <laughs> So, so along with the guide to the Jane verse, someone out there needs to get started on working on dust bunnies so we can market those. Um, <laughs> the next question is, what advice would you give to a writer who's just starting out? Don't use three names. <laughs> <laughs> Don't pick one name, stick with it. Um, I th seriously, I think the most important thing you can do is identify, know for sure what genre you feel called to write. Don't try to go into a genre that just because it's fashionable at the time or because it's trending or something. And the way to identify what you really love to write is probably look at what you love to read. Yeah. I think that's how most authors get there. Once you've done that, it pays to understand what you and you have responded as a reader to this particular genre, maybe for years, but you may not know why in, in intellectual terms, why you respond to it. So it's helpful to figure that out. If you read mysteries and you read a certain kind of mystery, are you reading it because you need that affirmation of justice? Are you needing it because you need that affirmation of um, righting a wrong? Um, you know, or is it something about the process of solving a murder that attracts you. Try to, try to nail down what it is 
that attracts you to that particular end of that genre. And every genre has dozens of, I mean, dozens of subgenres within them. So figure out which subgenre you're pulled to, kind of figure out what makes it work for you. And that's probably where to start. That's probably where you're going to find your most power. The biggest mistake I think most writers make at the beginning of their careers is they get that first book done and then they get the jitters. Because in one way they want to do it again, but another way they're terrified of doing it again because of and getting slapped with the label, oh, she did that in the other book. But people listen, <laughs> listen up people. Readers want the same emotional punch they got the first time. That's why they come back to you. You can fool around with the little plot points and backgrounds and stuff like that, but do not hesitate to go straight back to the emotions and the kinds of conflicts that called you the first time, because that's where your real power as a writer will lie. And you're gonna be messing around with that power and for the rest of your career. My books have changed in superficial ways over the years, but if you go back to the very first books I wrote, the core emotions, the core kinds of conflicts, um, the core characters are still mine and I'm still, I'm still finding new things to do with them. Well, you see that as a, as a reviewer and as a bookseller, you watch people come back again and again to a series and, and why are they doing that? Why don't they want something terribly new? It's, they want, it's kind of a dual-edged sword. They want the familiar and they want the new. They want the familiar world. They want to revisit those characters. It's comfortable. It's easy kind of to slip into the story. Same thing with television. Why are so many series popular? Because it's that world and there's, they can do cute things with plots and maybe introduce a new character, but you can't really mess with the core elements or the readers won't be happy. Uh -uh. Yeah. 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 Uh Whatever they responded to the first time, they want that same emotional punch. And that's something to keep in mind as a writer. Um, the next question is, what does your typical writing day look like? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I get up at five. <laughs> but I don't usually get to the computer until around seven. And I'm basically a morning person. When it comes to that kind of creativity, I, you better get me going in the mornings. It's not that I can't get a good idea in the afternoon, but usually whatever creativity I've got for the day is shot by noon. <laughs> and after that, I do more of the editing or detail work that is re reference uh, research, that kind of thing. And, and by evening, I'm ready for a glass of wine. <laughs> and, and then I just zone out like everybody else in front of the TV. <laughs> Um, how much input do you have into your covers as a writer? Not much. I've never had much, but it's probably a good thing because I don't have any visual sensibility. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can, like everybody else, I respond to a good cover or, you know, at least I respond to a certain look in a cover and I, and some covers will just strike me as beautiful or exciting or, or perfect for the book and all that, but I never in a million years could come up with it. To, to tell the, so I'm totally dependent on the art department and my editor who has insights into what she thinks brands the book in a sense or makes the book work. Here's the thing, covers have to, they have a huge responsibility. You were saying we're never supposed to judge a book by a cover, by a cover but we do, and mm -hmm. we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. And we do that because if it's well done cover, it works. The cover does tell you something about, it's like a little snapshot of the story. Maybe like a movie poster of the yeah. story. Maybe that's its job. And you sell movies based on movie posters or trailers. I mean, that's, and, and, it, and people have so much product to choose from when it comes, not only just to entertainment, but within the book world, there's so many books out there. They want a way of curating the list that they might be interested in. So they read book, lists of books, they, they look at covers, they, they're, they're craving some kind of little synopsis of the story, you know, just something that helps them decide if this is a book I'm going to waste 28 bucks on, or if this is a book I'm really going to enjoy. Hmm. Yeah, it's, you, you see it all the time at the, 
at the front desk in the poison pen, I'm sure. A good cover can sell a book even more. A bad cover can kill it. Yeah. Um, now I have a question. I'll take precedence and jump over a few other questions. But this um, guild boss is a return to your futuristic world after kind of a brief hi vacation hiatus, we'll call it. Are there plans for more Jane Castle books? Yes, glad you asked. I am actually writing the next one now for next year. So yes, okay. there's going back to the world was fun. I'd kind of forgotten about it because I got distracted. But what I, what I was doing during that hiatus was actually firing up my my new Amanda Quick World set in 1930s California, and I was wrapped up in that and focused on that. So the the guilt the uh, the futuristic books kind of went on the side while I found my feet in that new world. Um, but now it was fun to go back. The, the currently the last book and this book and the one in next fall um, in this Jane Castle series are all set in what I call Illusion Town. And Illusion Town is Las Vegas is, is Las Vegas on Harmony. It's it's what a futuristic Las Vegas might look like. And and there's a lot of room to maneuver there because look, the whole Las Vegas image is so dynamic and so colorful and so over the top that it's giving me a lot to work with because if there's anything this series is about, it's over the top. <laughs> <laughs> um in terms but you also have a very controlled writing voice the the world might be colorful exuberant but in the best possible way you you're very lean when it comes to your writing there's not a lot of <laughs> that's because i that's because i suck at description <laughs> <laughs> well I, i'm a narrative driven i mean i'm not narrative driven i am driven by dialogue it's the dialogue that comes alive for me and that's when i hit dialogue i'm flying mm -hmm. when i have to stop and actually describe a setting or a room or an office or a street that's a slog so i, I would like to take time for a public service announcement here if you're reading one of my books and you come across a paragraph of description please slow down pay attention because it took me forever to write that and i'd like you to notice it <laughs> You are, you are excellent in dialogue, and especially between your two main characters. You have that kind of, I'm almost thinking of Nick and Nora Charles, the way they parry off of each other and stuff like that. That's your one of your real gifts as a writer. I love it. I love that kind of repartee. And it's also a time of discovery for me, because when the characters start talking like that, that's when I figure out what the next twist in the plot is going to come from. It, it's a, I can't even describe how that works, but it, trust me, it works if you're a writer. Have your characters start talking to each other. You'll be amazed at what insights you'll get from that experience. We have another question, and this person would like to know, what do you do when you're not writing? Do you have any hobbies? Well, I used to have a really nice hobby of shopping at Nordstrom, but the pandemic is kind of... <laughs> I miss that hobby. I'm, a, I'm an online shopper for the most part now, but um, probably it, it doesn't qualify as a hobby. It qualifies as another passion, I guess, which is I do like to cook. Mm. So, and you you love to, to bake and you're so good at it. Is, does that qualify as a passion for us when we love to? I think so. Yeah. It's another way of um, creative expression, I guess. Or... It feels like more than a hobby, but yeah. Yeah. But that would probably be as closest. Um, I've also gotten pretty good on. Uh, I've, I've, one of the fun things out of the, this whole past year and a half has been I've discovered I love interviewing people on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> You're very good. You have a natural <laughs> flair for that. Well, you know, I've always I'm always curious about people, and a lot of questions you just don't can't mm -hmm. do with you know with with people, strangers, <laughs> yeah. um, but the interview process gives you the excuse to, to ask the questions that everybody's got a story. Everybody's world is different. And I'm just fascinated by that. It's, I find it, um, I find it intriguing and I'm, I'm enjoying the, when I get to do an interview with someone um, where I'm asking the questions, I have a, I enjoy that. That's, you have a, a real skill for that, a flair for that too. 
Um, the next question is not signed, but I think we can probably guess who sent it in. Uh, the question is, why are some authors like Christina Dodd crushing TikTok and other authors <laughs> like herself not able to handle it? Okay, thanks, Christina. Pal, <laughs> crushing TikTok, yes. I should start out by saying that Christina Dodd and I recently took a class in how to do TikTok. How does it work? Because neither one of us had a clue, really. And I decided that within two days, I was <laughs> never going to master TikTok. Christina, however, is sailing through TikTok. She has the gift. She's got the magic. If you're interested, go check out her TikTok page, which is just Christina Dodd books, Christina Dodd author. Yeah, TikTok, you start searching, you'll find it. Anyhow, she's doing her character confessions. She's posing as her characters. She's got all kinds of... Uh, cute videos. I mean, she's just, like she said, crushing TikTok. So <laughs> go find Christina Dodd on TikTok. Oh, and she writes books too. <laughs> uh, the next question is, how long does it take, for, take you to start and then finish a book? I'm guessing to turn it into your editor. Yeah, it's probably the entire process from start to finish is three to four months. Um, that's including a lot of cleanup time. You know, the basic plot and everything probably goes down within two and a half, three months at the most. And then I spend another month cleaning it up. Hmm. So. Um, well, that doesn't really give you a lot of time for hobbies then because you're fucking <laughs> like. Well, people got to eat. So <laughs> hence the cooking hobby. <laughs> another question is, what did you do during the pandemic to keep yourself in good spirits, I'm guessing. Did you discover television show or? I wrote. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, I, man, what I found out on, on, what my husband and I found out during the pandemic was how much television we'd missed over the years. <laughs> the whole series came and went five years ago. I never even heard of it. And now I could stream it. It's just, it's just weird. I didn't realize we were missing so much TV. Become a huge fan of the Acorn Channel with mysteries. They're the mysteries from they're coming out of mostly Australia, right? Yeah. And New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, and found lots of new mystery series, which is kind of our fallback. You know, that's the one thing we would for sure go back to again and again. How about you? What did what did you find on TV that well, one show that probably everyone else has already discovered that's new to me because I'm usually years beyond the general public was Succession on HBO. Yeah. I mean, totally, totally not my kind of show in theory. I mean, I, as someone once told me, you have the moral sensibilities of the Victorian maiden aunt, so shows with a lot of um, graphic language and things like that. But once you get into it, it's completely compelling the characterization and the writing and yeah it's a little bit scary how it mirrors the real world but yeah that truly is and then lots of baking shows yeah for that. The, yeah the, the great british baking bake, bake off yeah bake off. all Everybody. those shows yeah um, i'll put next, succession on the list here check it out i was surprised yeah i really and the only reason i was able to watch it was because my cable company said please don't quit we'll give you three <laughs> months for for the time period it's like okay now what i'm going to do with my three months run out am i going to spring for the they got you Oops, premium channels? <laughs> yeah um the next question is what kind of relationship do you have with social media as an author and do you have a favorite social media platform I'm probably most active simply because I got into it early on and I'm familiar with it on Facebook. That's just the one I learned about first and became comfortable with. I'm trying to do better at Instagram. Uh, gave up on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> badly. Um, and that's about it. Twitter, I don't pay. I, I'm on there, but uh, I don't do much. It's just kind of goes by. I'm, I don't pay a lot of attention to it. So I would say, uh, if you want to find me, um, try Instagram and Facebook. 
And you know, there's only so much you can do. Yeah. I just don't have the time. That's what that's what I figured out on TikTok. I don't have the time to do to do it and do it well. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not I'm not compelled by it. I, I don't feel comfortable with that particular format. Unlike, say, Christina Dodd, who is, oh. <laughs> who is a natural. <laughs> I mean, what can't Christina Dodd do? I mean, that's the question we all have to ask. <laughs> So, and rumor has it she has a new book coming out uh, next summer. So, Christina Dodd fans will want to stay tuned for that. Point um, last scene. Yes. Point last scene. And that's set in her fictional town in California named Gothic. I, I sense there's going to be some whispers of the Gothic sensibility in that book. Um, the last question we have time for is what have you read this year that you would like to share with other readers? Huh. Well, I've read, and it's an advanced copy of a book that's coming out in January, so not too far off, um, Rachel Grant's Crash Site. Huh. And if you were a fan of really smart, intelligent, romantic suspense, Rachel Grant is for you. Her heroine is an archeologist, and Rachel herself was trained as an archeologist, so she knows whereof she speaks. And she, you're gonna love the kind of the archeology span and how it works into the story. But at the same time, there's a very contemporary sensibility to the romance and the action and adventure on the ground. So I, um, I, I watched her, her first book was called Dangerous Ground and that's mm -hmm. already out. Yeah, that was terrific. Yeah. and. Crash Site comes out in January. So I recommend her. And because he's my cousin by marriage, I always recommend Mike Krentz, Frank's cousin actually, dead already. Mike is a former ER room, emergency room physician. And that's the setting for dead already. The, he, he really has a gift for bringing alive the action in the ER, that sense of drama that and the mystery, and the mystery is a very clever mystery that from, from the world of medicine. This has been a, a, we haven't seen a lot of really strong medical thrillers out there. I was thinking Robin Cook was like the last big name that really. And it's kind of weird because that's a perennial interest of Americans. We've had lots of medical TV shows, mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, the medical mystery is um, kind of rare and, and Mike does it awfully well. So. Even if he is a relative, <laughs> what's family for? Um, now, your current book that will be out soon or is already out is Guild Boss by Jane Castle. Um, I'll again mention we have just a very few signed copies by the author left. So seriously, if you're interested in um, getting one of those signed copies, you should not delay. You need to order online or call us soon because they will be gone before you can say it. Um, before we end, what's coming next for you? I, I know you have a book in January. Lightning in a Mirror. Lightning in a Mirror is the conclusion of the Fog Lake trilogy, which is a contemporary setting. It's under my Jane, Jane Ann Krentz name. And it's a three book, well, trilogy, duh. <laughs> <laughs> three book series um, featuring the fallout from some clandestine experiments run by the government in the parent, studying the paranormal back in the last century and now things are falling apart because of the experiments that were run back then. So it's wonderful. I think that's the one where the Swan sisters make an appearance. <laughs> I'm fascinated by those siblings. Um, we do have Lightning in a Mirror. It's already up for res reservation. So if you're interested, feel free to reserve Lightning in a Mirror. That will be coming in January. And I'm hoping there's going to be another Amanda Quick in May. Yes. It's called When She Dreams. Yeah, just got the cover on that. I'm thrilled with it. It, it has a bit of a Gothic, but the cover has a 1930s Gothic vibe to it. I think oh. you'll, you'll, you'll see when, when you start seeing the cover, what, how it works. Well, I can't believe how fast our time has flown by. I want to thank Jane um, for joining us today and for writing such terrific books and for you tuning in and listening to another virtual author event at the Poison Pen Bookstore. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. 
please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.